Erythrosuchus, or the red crocodile, was a gigantic predator that lived in South Africa over 240 million years ago. Its name comes from the reddish soil where its fossils were found. Standing out at five meters in length, its most striking feature was its unusually large head, which measured up to one meter nearly a third of its body. Its teeth were curved inwards and razor sharp designed to trap prey. For many years, people have debated whether Erythrosuchus was a clumsy slow creature or a true ambush predator. Its skull was central to how Erythrosuchus hunted and survived. At about one meter long, a proportion often described as around one third of the total body length, depending on the specimen, it dominated the overall silhouette. Thick bone sheathed its surface and along the margins ran teeth that curved inward like a row of hooked blades. Early reconstruction sometimes exaggerated the oddness of these proportions, but the key question was less about appearance and more about function. How did an animal operate with such a head? The assumption that a giant skull would make the animal clumsy or unstable does not hold when you examine the details. The jaws were not oversized blocks difficult to wield. Instead, their architecture formed a strong lever system tuned for precision in seizing prey. The maxilla and dentary carried recurved teeth whose inward point worked as a trap. Once something slipped past them, it was nearly impossible to pull free. Fine serrations lined the edges so even small jaw movements could saw through flesh, improving efficiency in tearing. What looked oversized turned out to be an integrated feeding tool. Bone surfaces and muscle attachment areas on the cranium provide additional evidence for this role. The skull and jaw joints indicate a substantial gape and very strong adductor musculature, enough to handle large prey rather than an awkward, useless bulk. Note cranial anatomy. Thickened posterior skull expanded occiput and deep mandibular fossae indicates massive jaw muscles similar in role to crocodilians, but scaled and positioned to drive deep puncturing bites. Instead of simply clamping like modern crocodiles, its jaws could deliver crushing pressure while the recurved serrated teeth sliced into tissue. This would have been capable of piercing thick hides and inflicting bone damaging bites. Features like these were not peculiar to Erythrosuchus alone. Paleontologists note a broader Triassic trend among some archosauriforms towards relatively larger skulls. A plausible functional response to the prey available after the Permo-Triassic extinction. Many herbivores of that world were large bodied and often heavily built so predators needed forceful weaponry to exploit them. A smaller head could not penetrate armor or thick hide with the same success. Erythrosuchus embodied that trend specializing in overpowering prey rather than matching it with agility. This likely influenced its hunting strategy. Pursuing fast, nimble animals across open terrain would have been inefficient. Far more plausible is an approach based on short bursts of violence. One scenario envisions the animal lying in wait near a water source, relying on its bulk and concealment until an unsuspecting herbivore strays close. At that critical moment, the jaws would open wide and a single strike could disable prey too massive for smaller predators. With its head as the primary weapon, its style emphasized sudden power, not sustained pursuit. All of this refocuses our attention. For that skull to be effective, the rest of the skeleton needed to stabilize and support it. A meter of bone and muscle at the front of the body brought enormous mechanical demands. The success of Erythrosuchus depended not only on delivering lethal bites, but also on the ability of the neck, torso and limbs to carry and control the load during those strikes. The evidence for how it managed that lies beyond the skull embedded in the postcranial skeleton designed to bear its most formidable feature. Supporting a head of that magnitude required more than just sharp teeth. It relied on an entire framework of bone and muscle beneath it. Erythrosuchus carried this weight with a body built for power. Its limbs were held in a semi-erect posture, not fully dinosaur-like, but not sprawling either, which provided better support for the oversized skull and allowed for short, forceful bursts of movement. This stance lifted the body clear of the ground, creating a predator stable enough to brace itself during sudden lunges. Early reconstructions called it clumsy. Modern anatomical study shows that the skeleton was purpose-built for momentary power, not sustained speed. The limb bones were massive, but their strength was not just about size. Reinforced shafts and strong muscle attachment points on the femur and humerus acted as load-bearing supports, while wide pelvic and shoulder girdles spread out the forces traveling through the torso. 
Even the spinal column contributed tall neural spines served as levers for musculature, and the occipital region of the skull shows expanded attachment surfaces. The cervical vertebrae themselves indicate powerful neck muscles features highlighted in anatomical studies of both skull and neck. Together, these adaptations allowed the head to strike without destabilizing the rest of the body. Seen alongside later Triassic predators, such as the slender, fast-moving Coelophysis, the contrast is striking, where those early dinosaurs developed lighter frames geared toward pursuit, Erythrosuchus committed to mass and impact. You can think of it less as a sprinter and more as a heavyweight competitor. The body was designed to absorb and channel explosive force, the planted feet, anchoring the weight, the torso tightening against recoil, and the neck whipping the jaws into position for a killing blow. Speed over distance was not the game plan. Decisive strength in the opening moment was. Some older authors suggested a semi-aquatic life, but bone structure and limb proportions are now usually interpreted as consistent with a primarily terrestrial ambush predator. The joints and girdles show an animal better suited to firm ground than to maneuvering in water. This interpretation matches its likely hunting style, lying in wait until a target strayed close, then launching forward with a single rapid strike. In this role, both body and head were tuned towards synergy. One anchored, the other attacked. Taken together, these features reveal that Erythrosuchus was not hampered by its proportions, but enabled by them. The skeleton worked as a stabilizing platform that made repeated ambush power possible. For a predator existing in ecosystem still rebuilding after a crisis, this was not a weakness but an advantage. And it raises a bigger question in the aftermath of mass extinction when old lineages had collapsed. What role did such animals play in shaping new food webs? The answer lies in the broader story of life clawing its way back from disaster and how powerful forms like Erythrosuchus seized opportunities in a recovering world. After the Permo-Triassic mass extinction, land ecosystems had to be built almost from scratch. Over 90% of marine species and most land vertebrates disappeared, leaving entire food webs in fragments. In this empty world, plants spread again across barren landscapes, followed by herds of early herbivorous reptiles that expanded with little resistance, with prey animals multiplying a gap opened at the top of the food chain. After the Permo-Triassic event, large-bodied herbivores and vacant predator niches favored robust, big-headed hunters. Erythrosuchids fit this role. Erythrosuchus and its relatives rose into that space as some of the earliest apex carnivores of the Triassic. What makes their rise especially striking is the speed and distribution of their success. Erythrosuchidae fossils are documented across Pangaea in the early Middle Triassic, notably in South Africa, Russia, China and India, indicating the clade's wide early distribution. This was not an isolated phenomenon confined to one corner of the supercontinent. Across distant environments emerging from collapse, the same pattern appeared large, heavy predators filling the most powerful roles in the food chain. That convergence tells us their body plan was not an evolutionary accident, but an adaptation that worked across many regional contexts. They were early and often locally dominant apex predators, but their dominance varied by region and time. In some ecosystems, erythrosuchids clearly sat at the top, stabilizing prey populations and acting as territorial hunters. In others, they likely coexisted with different carnivorous lineages competing for similar opportunities. Fossil evidence does not show them overwhelming all settings, but where conditions favored them, where prey was sizable and defense was thick hide rather than speed, they thrived. The ecological impact of their design becomes clearer in this context. Their skeletal strength and semi-erect posture meant they could hold and drive a skull nearly one-third of their total body length. That enormous head already discussed in detail earlier was not just impressive, it allowed them to subdue prey of comparable mass. This made them unparalleled ambush specialist central figures in predator-prey networks that were still stabilizing after global collapse. Prey animals in these environments had to navigate not only recovering vegetation and unstable climates, but also the presence of stocky reptiles waiting to unleash crushing power. Their lifestyle was probably not about chasing down meals across wide territories. More likely, they operated as regional strongholds dominant within their ranges, relying on bursts of power rather than endurance. In this sense, Erythrosuchids shaped their ecosystems as much by intimidation as by predation. In fragmented Triassic landscapes, that strategy was sufficient for survival and even success. 
Their presence across multiple continents stands as a marker of resilience in a world still reassembling itself. This broad distribution carries another lesson. It highlights how quickly large predators could rebound after even the most devastating extinction event. Within just a few million years, Erythrosuchids had risen to high positions in several continental food webs. They were not only carnivores, but also ecological stabilizers, enforcing balance as environments healed. Their heavy frames and oversized heads were not evolutionary excess, but a working solution to an unstable world. If they were so successful across continents, why don't we see them later in the Triassic? That question leads directly into the next section. The Triassic world did not remain frozen in the shape that Erythrosuchus once dominated. Over time, its heavy-headed ambush design faced new pressures as landscapes, prey animals, and predator guilds shifted in response to ongoing environmental change. This gradual reshaping of ecosystems set the stage for what we often call the dinosaur takeover. One hypothesis holds that changing prey and habitats gradually favored more cursorial agile predators, including early dinosaurs, but this is debated. The fossil record suggests a gradual ecological turnover rather than a single direct competitive overthrow. In other words, the disappearance of forms like Erythrosuchus does not appear as a sudden collapse. Instead, their ecological edge narrowed bit by bit as other strategies proved more responsive to shifting prey and new terrains. Examples often used to illustrate the rising body plan are small, lightly built dinosaurs, such as Coelophysis in North America and Eoraptor in South America. Note these named dinosaurs appear later in the Triassic record and are examples of the more agile body plan that became common. Unlike the massive archosauriforms before them, they relied on light skeletons, long legs and tails that balanced their movements in rapid pursuit. Where Erythrosuchus relied on surprise and raw power, these forms leaned into speed and sustained agility. But the story is not only dinosaurs against Erythrosuchids. Other possibilities include environmental shifts, changing prey body plans, and new archosauriform lineages diversifying into different feeding modes. These ecological transitions together likely reduced the relative advantage of the heavy-headed ambush strategy. Following the Permo-Triassic crisis, herbivores initially spread as large, slow-moving browsers ideal for ambush predators. By the middle to late Triassic, many herbivores adopted a more gracile, quick-footed frame which demanded equally mobile predators. That change alone would have tipped the balance. Climate instability added more weight to this process. The Triassic swung between humid intervals and prolonged drought. Plants shifted in distribution herds, migrated unpredictably, and predators had to be mobile just to keep pace. Ambush hunters anchored to specific hunting grounds may have struggled when prey failed to pass through consistently. More cursorial carnivores, whether dinosaurs or other archosauriforms, could track these herds across widening ranges. Over time, adaptability and movement became just as important as power in attack. It is worth stressing that extinction patterns often move slowly. Large-headed ambushes did not vanish overnight. Fossil distributions show erythrosuchids and related lineages present well into the Middle Triassic long after smaller, faster forms appeared. Think succession more than battlefield, the old strategy became less optimal as ecosystems changed. Dinosaurs did not storm in and remove them in one dramatic clash, but thrived in niches that were no longer suited to their predecessors. Viewed from that angle, the decline of Erythrosuchus feels less like defeat and more like ecological replacement. Heavy power-based carnivores held center stage until ecosystems leaned toward mobility, then lighter, faster hunters grew into the same spaces. The balance of predation shifted, leaving behind one model and embracing another. Which scenario do you think sounds most likely direct competition, climate-driven, habitat change or something else? Tell me in the comments. What matters is how this transition reshaped the role of apex predators. It set the foundation for the Mesozoic to be remembered less for brute-headed reptiles and more for a lineage whose body plan matched a world in motion. Erythrosuchus shows that evolution can solve the same problem with brute strength rather than speed and that those solutions can be transient when environments change. Studying its skull, neck and limbs reveals a coherent ambush predator package and its decline illustrates how ecosystems rewire after major upheavals. There are other early archosauriform experiments in the Triassic. Some occupied coastal niches, others evolved sailbacks, and each tells us something about early archosaur evolution. If you like this deep dive into Triassic predators, hit subscribe and tell us ambush power or pursuit speed, which would you bet on in a Triassic showdown?